this week in the parish of Bourses and Market Structure, RIP LIBOR, CBOT floor goes electric and it's NASDAQ 743 versus LSE 133 to complete what was a record year for IPOs. My name is Patrick L. Young. Welcome to the Bourse Business Weekly Digest. It's the Exchange Invest Weekly Podcast, Episode 126. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. This is a very brief reduction of highlights amongst the key headlines from the week in market structure. All the analysis of the many events which took place during the course of the past week can be found in Exchange Invest's unique daily newsletter. The subscriber guide to the bourse business sent daily to your inbox. More details at exchangeinvest.com. Nasdaq welcomed 743 IPOs and 35 exchange transfers in 2021, a sensational performance. More IPOs in one group than we had across, well, whole continents not that long ago. By comparison, the London Stock Exchange was incredibly excited at being the European market leader with 133 IPOs. Admittedly, that was three times 2020, but nonetheless, a pale shadow of what went on in North America. Nicey by comparison, I made at 265 by early December, making for an incredible 1,000 listings between the two leading US stock markets alone. Indeed, Nasdaq ended the year only a whisker short, I believe, of double the New York Stock Exchange money raise. By early December, it was $191.38 billion on NASDAQ versus $109.25 billion on NYSE. That makes a huge volta face from most years post.com, where NYSE has been the listings leader. Meanwhile, over in Istanbul, the number of investors in the Turkish stock exchange Börse Istanbul has reached 2.4 million, adding 500,000 people from the 1.9 million who were registered in the previous year, according to the head of the Capital Markets Board of Turkey. The European Union's securities watchdog ESMA said, please don't cut off euro clearing in London for now. London's two big derivatives clearing houses should not be cut off from customers in the European Union until there are incentives to shift business to the bloc, such as capital charges, ESMA have said, according to an article in Reuters. It amounts to the dirty, desperate war of deranged euro control. Exchange Invest is the daily must-read by the most influential figures operating the world's best markets. We invite you to join the exclusive group of Bourse bosses and other C-suite executives who make Exchange Invest the exchange of information, their daily business intelligence guide to markets the world over. Exchange Invest is available to subscribers at US$200 per user per year or currency equivalent. You can get more details at exchangeinvest.com or email me patrick at derivativesvision.com. Meanwhile, speaking about the dirty, desperate derangement of European regulators, FASE, the Federation of European Securities Exchanges, had cause to gripe before Christmas as they raised concerns over ESMA's annual statistical report on 2020 data. With Brexit looming on December the 31st of 2020, well, ESMA indulged in a prodigious piece of spurned spice meets Muppet Madness. ESMA just carved the UK's 19 trillion euros in equity trading out of the 2020 statistics. Presumably, this was a kind of post horse bolt repo move to try and make the European Union look more viable after Brexit, which took place, of course, at the start of last year. 
applauded Stefezi for pointing out this amateur hour manipulation of data, which, had it been done by an enterprise, would have led to no end of sanctions and complaints, methinks. This amounts to a very embarrassing start for new ESMA bosses, Verena Ross and Natasha Kazanev. As for any notion that the EU ESMA can be trusted, that's, well, dizzyingly proximate to the same level as, say, worldwide wrestling or fair results in Formula One for credibility. Good news from the LME, at least from a customer perspective, they're leaving trading fees flat in 2022 owing to the pandemic. And that jumps us into some big stories from this year so far. Hong Kong's IPOs appear to be exempted from the finalised cybersecurity rules. That's going to be a big fillip to the Hong Kong exchanges. It seems the cybersecurity rule check audits will only take place if you're seeking to list on an exchange which is outside China. And of course, China includes the special administrative region of Hong Kong. Elsewhere, Hong Kong were eager to make the most of a dynamic festive season. Sparks a go go and ETF Connect being agreed. The former futures trading floor of the Chicago Board of Trade is going to become an electricity substation. ComEd bought the 300,000 square foot 333 LaSalle Street building, which formerly housed part of the CBOT floor. Connet purchased it from CME Group for 39.5 million US dollars. Thus, a once electric atmosphere gives way to a more elemental electric generation facility. The floor itself had been known as the Arboretum after the now disgraced chairman Pat Arbor, who led the project. It famously had space for a Boeing 747 to sit, such was the size of the floors. Alas, despite moving their HQ from Seattle to Chicago a couple of years later, said Aviation Corporation never bit the bullet to deploy said floor as a showroom, as indeed I mused at the time in the Financial Times. Interesting that Pat Arbor was quoted in the article from the Chicago Sun-Times about the Arboretum being sold to Con Ed, noting he and other exchange leaders were slow to appreciate how fast electronic markets would develop. Well, there's an entirely honest comment where almost an entire generation of exchange leaders lacked the ability to foresee the future. Over in Bangladesh, the Bangladesh SEC is pushing for the Dhaka Stock Exchange and the Chittagong Stock Exchange to achieve demutualization as soon as possible. At the top of this show, I mentioned the incredible number of IPOs in North America. Well, here's a cracking statistic for 2021, which amounts to the year of the option. The OCC, the Options Clearing Corporation, they're the people who clear all of the individual stock options trading in the United States of America. They cleared a record setting 9.93 billion total contracts. That amounts to volumes being up 32% in what amounts to a mature market. Elsewhere in mature markets, the CME Group, their average daily volume is up 4% year on year, which was highly disappointing. In Brexit news, London's banking job exodus to the European Union has slowed despite Brexit. Essentially, a load of share trading moved to the European Union and the jobs stayed in London. I suppose that's why we can understand how EU apparatchiks are ending up waking in the middle of the night with a fevered brow screaming, Substance! In new markets this week, Warsaw and Budapest stock exchanges are teaming up to create a new commodity market clearing house in the Hungarian capital. Elsewhere, talk about laying the groundwork for a Congolese stock exchange and Africa got its first digital exchange for native producers, ACEX. Despite the festive period, we still had a few interesting deals. The EEX, the European Energy Exchange, they acquired the energy analytics firm Las Chima Group. Meanwhile, the Competition Bureau of Canada reached an agreement with S&P Global related to its acquisition of IHS Market. 
And in a little piece of news, which is very exciting for PLY, myself, Patrick L. Young, the presenter of this show, for it relates to a company of which I'm an executive director, the Aquas Stock Exchange listed Valerium. Valerium have made a move to acquire the Juno Group, that's a major trust provider in Gibraltar, bringing trusts, fund administration and company administration under the Valerium banner. Lots of publicity about that over the Christmas holiday period. And don't forget, Valerium also holds an option to acquire the majority of the Gibraltar Stock Exchange. If you're looking for some reading, whether you're locked down, whether you're waiting for the results of your PCR test, your lateral flow test, or indeed you just happen to be, well, looking for something interesting to read, don't forget my latest book, Victory or Death, Blockchain, Cryptocurrency and the Fintech World. To understand how technology is affecting life and markets, this is the book to help you. 20 years on from the excitement of the original fintech bestseller, Capital Market Revolution. While you're waiting for your copy of Victor or Death to arrive, check out our live stream. That's on Tuesdays at 6 p.m. London time, 1 p.m. New York time. And we will be back coming this Tuesday. In crypto land, gosh, an epic moment. The crypto exchange Binance have signed a deal to be regulated in the Dubai World Trade Center. Given the itinerant nature of the controversial Binance brand for many years, perhaps some might see this as, well, not being ideal branding for Dubai itself. Does it mean the HQ reclusive Binance has finally settled on somewhere it will call home and even have an office public can locate? Watch this space, or I suppose listen to this space. Elsewhere, the CFTC got laid in with the first big fine of the year. They went after decentralized prediction market platform Polymarket, fined them $1.4 million and ensured that they shut down non-compliant markets. Splat! First blood to the CFTC, I would expect more. As the year goes on, the binary polymath, surely binary polymath is kind of a contradiction in terms. Anyway. Polymath was censured, and I would imagine Gary Gensler's SEC will be eager to catch up with their crosstown futures-based rivals, the CFTC. Finally, in crypto news this week, Kevin O'Leary, Mr. Wonderful. The Kevin O'Leary-backed WonderFi is buying the Canadian crypto exchange BitBuy. Product news over the course of the Christmas holiday, the Shanghai London Stock Connect will soon include Germany and Switzerland, apparently. Elsewhere, Hong Kong Exchange itself has opened two SPAC listings from January the 1st. And the Nigerian Exchange is concluding arrangements to roll out its first set of derivatives on its largest single stock names in a move expected to deepen the stock market and provide investors with new investment instruments. In technology news over the course of the festive season, Equinix, they announced a collaboration with NASDAQ to scale their digital infrastructure. That agreement supports the build-out of cloud infrastructure in Carteret, New Jersey. In other words, NASDAQ is going nowhere. Their shift to the cloud is committing to New Jersey, avoiding major hassles for many traders. But at the same time, it sounds as if NASDAQ is comfortable. There's not going to be a securities tax in New Jersey, as had been threatened only a few months before. The acquisition of trading technologies by Seven Ridge is now complete. It's a good piece of news that appeared over the course of the festive season. Elsewhere in technology news, the Philippine Stock Exchange, they were forced to cancel trading on Tuesday, the 4th of January, over a technical glitch. And SEBI, the Indian regulator, is planning to bring in a third-party agency to revamp their IT network and communication systems. Doubtless, there will be a vast and convoluted RFP, RFQ, RF, anything else which they can possibly think of, and at some point that process will result in them choosing Tata or some other Indian combine. Regulation News ESMA are launching calls for evidence on distributed ledger technology and rule changes to accommodate tokenized securities. Elsewhere, El Salvador, they're planning a raft of legislation to cover their Bitcoin 
bond issuance. Thanks for listening to Exchange Invest Weekly. We welcome your feedback. You can contact me directly, patrick at derivativesvision.com, with any comments. Meanwhile, if you enjoyed this show, we would welcome you giving us a thumbs up. Or, if you have time, a positive review will always be welcome, wherever you find this podcast. In the USA, that's leading career path news, Joe Brezhnev, I mean Biden, I mean actually Brezhnev, the American president has tapped two new Republican members of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. Summer Mersinger and Caroline Pham are looking to fill the Republican spots on the CFTC. Elad Roisman. On the other side of Washington, he's announced his departure as a commissioner of the Securities and Exchange Commission. There's a new CEO of the Qatar Stock Exchange. Tamim Hamad Al-Khawari is going to replace Rashid bin Ali Al-Mansouri, who is going to remain on the board of directors of the Qatar Stock Exchange for some time to come. Keith Todd has assumed the role as Chief Executive of Trading Technologies. Farewell then, Tim Giannopoulos, who was only in situ as Rick Lane's TT successor since January. Keith Todd is going to be bringing a new perspective to Trading Technologies. And finally, in Career Paths, Equity Group, they're in the business of CFD and related broking, I believe. They've appointed the former CEO of the DGCX, the Dubai Gold and Commodity Exchange, Gorang Desai, to lead their strategy. All the very best to Gorang. In Big World, a New York Post story struck us during December. America is finally getting wise to how bad a deal college can be. Being generally Underwhelmed by the mediocre groupthink, which is bestowed by college on many more blob-centric blunt force trauma to the brain than thinking expander per se that university tends to be, it surprises me not that there's a big market failure out there in the expense of dogma styling itself as education. Why bother spending three years and a six-figure sum, most ending up as debt, to get out of Gamma Delta Omicron fraternity, only to find the nerdy kid who spent hours on Coursera for free or for next to no dollars is a long way up the earning ladder as a coder. This is a mega trend. The outmoded university system is utterly unfit for purpose in the USA, UK and Europe. Thus, US student enrollment is rather shockingly down 6.5% over the course of the last two years. And finally, let's end this week in the courtroom. Gillian Maxwell is looking at a long time before she exits Slammer Central somewhere in the USA. And of course, a huge element of the media are wildly sympathetic because posh socialists with privileged backgrounds shouldn't be subject to the same forces of law and order as the rest of us. Meanwhile, in other court news, as Elizabeth Holmes' coiffeur soared to new heights of achievement, it seems she beat four, the jury deadlocked on three, but she got beaten by four charges from her blood testing software, where the prick seemed to be anywhere but in the blood testing, as it were. Anyway, nobody seems to have noticed in the mainstream media, but were you aware that her parents are a former congressional staffer and an Enron executive? How on earth this young woman's moral compass could have fallen so far from its natural magnetic north point of honesty is clearly a topic for a heated dinner party conversation during the course of January. And on that mysterious and magnificent note, my name is Patrick L. Young. I would like to wish you a great week in blockchain, life and markets, and a judiciously distributed, happy, healthy, peaceful and prosperous new year. We'll be back next week, same time, same place. Have a great week. This show relates to the business of bourses. It is not to be construed as investment advice, nor are we making any investment recommendations. 
Please consult an investment advisor before you make any investments, and for goodness sake, do your due diligence and do not make investments without complying with the regulations in your home state. Exchange Invest cannot be held responsible for any investment decisions made as a result of our programme, which is for entertainment purposes only. The material herein is copyright Patrick L. Young at the date of publication, while our music and sound effects are sourced from copyright-free sources. Thanks for listening to Exchange Invest Weekly, the exchange of information.